Good evening. This is Dr. Bob Uzzle, instructor in political science at Cedar Valley College. Uh, this uh, lecture tonight has to do with political parties. A political party is a group that may include office holders, candidates, activists, and voters who pursue their common interest by gaining and exercising power through the electoral process. There's two kinds of political organizations referred to by James Madison as factions. One is a political party, the other is an interest group. They're, neither one are mentioned in the U.S. Constitution, but they've been around a long time. It's hard to remember, it's hard to imagine American politics without these uh, political organizations. And uh, the political parties try to win elections. Interest groups seek to uh, pursue, uh, well, they, tr they seek to influence public policy in other ways besides electoral politics. The principal drafter of the Declaration of Independence was Thomas Jefferson. He was the second vice president and the third president of the United States. He was the co-founder of the Democratic Republican Party, one of the first two parties along with the Federalist Party of John Adams. Another type of uh, organization related to the parties is what's known uh, as uh, a political machine, a party organization for recruit that res recruits voters. They recruit loyalty with tangible incentives and is characterized by a high degree of control over member activity. And uh, so we see we have uh, these machines, which uh, for many years, the Democrats in New York had a machine called Tammany Hall. Thing you need to remember about political machines, they did do some good works as some charitable activities, but they're best known for their graft and corruption. Now, if you become part of a political machine, if you do what you're told, Follow all the rules. Don't rock the vote. You can go far. But if you step out of line, we'll be into you. And uh, both parties had machines at various times. And the uh, first two, uh, well, the political parties developed in the early republic. Uh, George Washington was very skeptical of them. The election of 1800 was the first real partisan election. Well, no, let me backtrack on that. It was 1796. Federalist John Adams defeated Democratic Republican Thomas Jefferson. But there was a rematch in 1800, and Jefferson won. And this was something that was very unusual at that time in history, something we take for granted today. Peaceful transition. One party coming in, another party going out with no violence. In the past, if someone wanted to take over a position, they would knock off whoever was in there and they'd take over. But you have one party going out, another party coming in and no violence. And that was very unusual that day and time. And then you had a period in which you had uh, one party in power for a period of uh, 24 years. Jefferson was with the Democratic Republican Party. He was elected in 1800, re-elected in 1804. Uh, his handpicked successor was his 
Secretary of State James Madison, elected in 1808, re-elected in 1812. And then the third and final member of the Virginia dynasty, James Monroe, elected 1820 uh, and, uh, pardon me, 1816, re-elected 1820. So you got, uh, they easily defeated their Federalist opponents. But there was a change in 1824 when John Quincy Adams, the son of John Adams, was elected president on a short-lived National Republican Party. And, uh, but he lost his bid for re-election in 1828 when Thomas Jefferson, I'm sorry, I'm getting confused on that. When Andrew Jackson was elected. Andrew Jackson was the first president to run on the platform of the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party was derived from Jefferson's Democratic Republican Party, but they were not the same because uh, Jer uh, Andrew Jackson referred to himself as a Jeffersonian. Thomas Jefferson said Andrew Jackson's a dangerous man. So there, were, there was not a harmonious relationship there at all. There have been various periods in which different parties have dominated. The Federalist Party fizzled out when they opposed the War of 1812. But they were replaced, more or less, by the Whig Party. They got their name from the British Whigs. In England, the uh, Whigs opposed King George, whereas the Tories supported him. The uh, Whigs in the United States opposed King Andrew because they believed that Andrew Jackson had too much power. Then you had the, uh, in the 1850s, the Whigs fizzled out and were replaced by the Republican Party. The Republican Party came into existence in the first place to expose, to block the extension of slavery into new territory. Not necessarily in slavery itself. That came later. 1856, John C. Fremont was the first Republican to run for president. He was defeated by Democrat James Buchanan. 1860, Abraham Lincoln was the first successful Republican presidential candidate. Uh, Lincoln's views at the time on slavery were where slavery already exists, we will leave it alone. But he was determined to block any new slave states from entering the Union. On the other hand, uh, uh, in the crucible of civil war, no doubt Lincoln's views evolved, in which he became instrumental in passing the 13th Amendment that would end slavery once and for all. And so there have been various periods of history. 1860 to 1932 is referred to the golden age of American politics. Uh, again, Lincoln was elected for the first time in 1860. The Democrats split that year. The Northern Democrats nominated Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois on a platform known as popular sovereignty. Popular sovereignty was the position that uh, um, the, the states should have the right to decide for themselves whether or not they wish to allow slavery. He was nominated by the Northern Democrats the Southern Democrats nominated uh, Vice President John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky, 
who argued that slave owners should be allowed to take their slaves wherever they wish without interference by the government. John Bell of Tennessee ran on the Constitutional Union Party with uh, a very nebulous platform calling for um, adherence to the Constitution. He did well in some, uh, he carried some states in the Upper South, but Lincoln's victory was quite decisive. And of course, it led to Civil War. 1864, he ran for and won a second term, Lincoln did. And uh, Lincoln uh, was opposed that time by General John C. Breckinridge. I'm sorry, George B. McClellan was the Democratic nominee for president. His position was that the war had been a failure. He was calling for an armistice with the South. Now, by then, many in the South had realized winning on the battlefield was not possible. The best thing they could hope for was that Nick, that Lincoln would be defeated for re-election and a new Democratic administration might be willing to settle with the Confederacy on terms more acceptable. Lincoln won and the war continued. Um, and he was assassinated in 1865 and he was followed by a series of weak presidents. And it was uh, eventually the, the power began to shift, you know, Lincoln was a very strong president. His successor, Andrew Johnson, was not a strong president. And he ended up getting impeached, but not removed. Um, the administration of Le Ulysses S. Grant was very corrupt, to say the least. And uh, the uh, it wasn't until 1896 when... William McKinley was elected and re-elected in 1900, that you began uh, uh, having more strength in the White House. Uh, McKinley was assassinated in 1901 and succeeded by the hero of the Battle of San Juan Hill, Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt e easily won another term in um, 1904 and was succeeded by another Republican, William Howard Taft in 1908. These periods were uh, largely Republican eras. The period uh, leading up to this time, uh, the only Democrat to serve uh, in the 19th century after James Buchanan was Grover Cleveland, who was also the only president to serve two non-consecutive terms. Then. Woodrow Wilson, a Democrat, won in 1912 and 1916. But otherwise, it was largely a Republican era until 1932 with the election of Democrat uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt. The um, political parties have a lot of influence. There's no question about that. And a national tradition is the party conventions. Uh, the um, the National Convention is their job to nominate the president and vice president and also to uh, adopt the party platform. All that could easily be done in one day if they wanted to. But they have four-day conventions. The host city gets a lot of money for the hotels and restaurants and other businesses benefiting. And the conventions are a big pep rally that generates a lot of excitement in the campaign. 
and uh, most of the time the nominee receives a post-convention bounce in the polls. He has to work hard in order to keep it, however. And uh, so the National Party Platform is a statement of the general and specific philosophy and policy goals of a political party, usually promulgated at the National Convention. If you consider yourself a Democrat, more than likely, when you compare the platforms of the Democrat Party and the Republican Party, you're going to find more in the Democrat platform you agree with than at the Republican platform. But don't be surprised if you find some things in the Republican platform that you like and some things in the Democrat platform you don't like. The same thing applies if you're a Republican, comparing the uh, two platforms. And uh, our textbook has a picture of Pro President Franklin D. Roosevelt. He dedicated himself to building the Democratic Party both in the electorate and in the government. His rise to the presidency and spirited campaigns contributed to the New Deal realignment that drew blue collar workers, uh, labor union members, white southerners, and the poor to the Democratic Party. It shows a picture of him uh, being greeted by Georgia farmers while en route to Warm Springs, Georgia, just before the 1932 election. Um, Roosevelt had a tremendous impact in the Democratic Party, an uh, impact that's still being felt today. One group that became Democrats during the 1930s was African Americans. They had previously been mainly Republican. Keep in mind, Abraham Lincoln was a Republican. And for many years, the Democratic Party, while well, the Republican Party was seen as the party of Lincoln, the Democrats were identified with the South and the defeated Confederacy. But Robert Lee Van, editor of a black newspaper in uh, called the Pittsburgh Courier, he wrote an editorial in 1932 in support of Roosevelt, urging the, his black readers to go home and turn the picture of Lincoln to the wall. The debt is paid in full. African American voters, well, the, the Republicans couldn't maintain their support by just invoking the name of Lincoln. And uh, many were helped by the programs of the New Deal. And thus they uh, left the party of Lincoln for the party of Roosevelt. The uh, Party identification is a citizen's attachment to a political party based on issues, ideology, past experience, or upbringing, which tends to be a reliable indicator of likely voting choices. And so um, you can be a Democrat or you can be a Republican, a Libertarian, or whatever by just declaring yourself one. You don't have to file an application. You don't have to pay any dues. Just say you are and you are. Now, there's different levels of membership. Uh, there are sustaining members of each party that contribute so much per month uh, in support of the party. And uh, they have uh, supposed to give some honors and benefits to that. But uh, you can be one without just, just by saying you are. And uh, on page 258, uh, it says in the decade before 1948, African Americans identified as Democrats about as often as they did Republican. Two key events increased African American support for the Democratic Party. The first was Democratic President Harry S. Truman's explicit appeal 
1948 for new civil rights measures from Congress, including voter protections, a federal ban on lynching and bolstering existing civil rights laws. Uh, and uh, Truman, by the way, has a mixed record on race relations. He made some statements that were quite racist. But by executive order, he desegregated the military. And there were some other gains in civil rights during the Truman administration in the 19, late 40s and early 50s. And the second big jump, 1964 Civil Rights Act, is no, in no election since 1936 has a Republican candidate for president got more than 40% of the black vote. And uh, of course, more African Americans came to the polls in 2008 than in any previous election for the simple reason the historic chance to elect Barack Obama as the first African American president of the United States. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the statistics were in 2012 because uh, you can only do something the first for the first time once, and after that, it's not the same anymore. There's different uh, studies done about race and ethnicity, age, and other factors, and how they contribute to uh, one's uh, involvement in in party politics. And um, Hispanics supplement African Americans as Democratic stalwarts by about two thirds. Hispanics prefer the Democratic Party. Uh, some divisions do exist on country of origin with Mexican Americans, Puerto Ricans, and Central Americans historically aligned with the Democrats. Cuban Americans tended to be more Republican, but over the last several years, they have shifted toward the Democrats. Many of the first uh, Cubans to come here had fled the regime of Fidel Castro, and they accused Democrats of being soft on communism. And Currently, Texas has a U.S. Senator who is a Cuban-American by the name of Ted Cruz, identified with the Tea Party, the very cons conservative influence within the Republican Party. The uh, got a new generation of Cubans, however, that were never under Castro, and so they don't have the same ideology as such. Asians Americans tend to identify as Republicans in the 2016 presidential election. Shifting demographics ultimately were not enough to propel Hillary Clinton to the White House. About Asian Americans, uh, that would be especially true with Vietnamese Americans, uh, who many came to America to escape the communist takeover in 1975. But you got a whole two generations that have been born since the Vietnam War ended. They don't have the same memories. And some of them are more open toward the Democrats. And uh, age, uh, middle aged voters tend to favor the Republican Party. These voters often at the height of their career and subsequently their earning potential tend to favor the low taxes championed by Republicans. In contrast, Democrats' more liberal positions on social issues tend to resonate with today's moderate but socially progressive young adults. The nation's oldest voters who were alive during the, the Great Depression tend to favor the Republican Party. Uh, and Social and economic factors uh, tend to um, enter into it. 
far as educational levels, those with with uh, education like less than high school and those with PhDs, higher degrees, tend to be Democratic. Those in between tend to be Republican. And uh, certainly higher income Americans tend to vote Republican. Religion can be evaluated based on both denomination, religiosity, how frequently an individual engages in activities such as prayer and church attendance, respect to religious denominations, Jewish and black Protestant voters tend to favor the Democratic Party, while Mormons and white Protestants, especially Methodist, Presbyterians, and Episcopalians tend to align with Republicans. Many years ago, I read an article that described the the Episcopal Church as the Republican Party at prayer. And by the way, I like the Episcopal Church, unless I'm not being uh, putting anybody down here. Religiously unaffiliated voters align them primarily with the Democratic Party by a more than 40 point gap. The Republican Party has also made gains, made gains among the most religious identifiers of all sects. And these increase may reflect the party's visible support for socially conservative viewpoints, including opposition to abortion and contraception. The late Reverend Jerry Falwell, founder and pastor of the Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia, and also of Liberty University. Falwell was founder of a moral majority, which no longer exists, but it was an effort to combine conservative religion and conservative politics. But it was never a totally Christian organization. While the majority of the members were conservative Protestants, there were Roman Catholics, Jews, and Mormons in the moral majority. And uh, many of them tended to be very conservative in their politics. Um, some Catholics were att attracted to moral majority because of the opposition to abortion. Many Jews were attracted to moral majority because of Falwell's strong support for Israel. Uh, of course, when you're speaking of Protestantism, you're speaking of everything between from Pentecostalism to high church Anglicanism. And there's a lot of variation in between. And the, we've already pointed out that white and black Protestants tend to be very different in their voting patterns. So there's a lot of different variables that are involved here. Minor parties or third parties have existed for a long time. Some of these uh, have included uh, the populist. Well, actually, you go back further than that, in the 1840s, 1850s, Liberty and Free Soil parties were both anti-slavery. And um, the populist, 1892, they were strong in the prairie states. Then you had the Dixiecrats in 1948, led by Strom Thurmond, who were opposed to integration and uh, there's um, the Green Party supports the environment the socialist communist libertarian parties have their ideologies there have been three uh, different parties unrelated to each other that refer to themselves as the progressive party in 1912 Teddy Roosevelt decided to seek the Republican presidential nomination. He didn't run for re-election in 1908. 
but um, he found his hand-picked successor, William Howard Taft, had deviated from what he was expecting. Therefore, he uh, founded, uh, or well, was nominated by the Bull Moose Party, he called it a progressive party. Taft had uh, control of the party machinery, and so he turned back Roosevelt's challenge for the nomination. But Taft threw in the towel before Election Day, made not one campaign speech. And Teddy was able to actually get more votes, both popular vote and electoral votes, than Taft. That was the only time in history a third party has did better than a major party. He still didn't do good enough because with the Republicans split, it was an easy victory for Woodrow Wilson and the Democrats. And uh, 1924, fighting Bob La Follette of Wisconsin ran for president on the Progressive Party ticket. Then in 1948, a very interesting man, Henry A. Wallace, was the Progressive Party candidate. Henry Wallace was a native of Iowa, third generation Henry Wallace, and um, publisher of Wallace's Farmer and Iowa Homestead. Also, the founder of Pioneer Hybrid Seed Company, and he was a farmer, a scientist, an economist, truly a remarkable man. He served two terms as Secretary of Agriculture under Franklin D. Roosevelt. He served uh, during Roosevelt's third term. He served as Vice President. But in going into the 1940 convention, Roosevelt was seeking an un unprecedented third term. The Democratic leadership felt more than likely Roosevelt was going to win. But they were concerned about his age and health. They didn't think he was going to live out that term, and he didn't. Henry Wallace was a liberal visionary. They did not want him a heart baited away from the presidency, so they dumped him from the ticket and replaced him with uh, Missouri Senator Harry S. Truman. And uh, on April 12th, 1945, Roosevelt died of a stroke at Warm Springs, Georgia. Harry Truman became president. In the meantime, uh, Roosevelt had given Wallace a consolation prize as uh, Secretary of Commerce. He served for a little over a year in that position under Truman. Then he criticized Truman's foreign policy and as a result was asked to resign and he did. And uh, in 1948, he ran against Truman as a third party candidate on the uh, progressive ticket and lost. In the past, there were liberals and conservatives in both parties. And there's still some today, but not as many. The Republicans have gotten more conservative. Democrats have become more liberal, but you know the what generally happens in a presidential election year in seeking the nomination a candidate. If they're Democrat, they'll become more liberal. If they're Republican, they'll become more conservative. But once they're nominated, facing the general election, having to appeal to a wide variety of voters. They tend to become 
more moderate. Both of them do. So anyway, uh, we have what's called polarization. The consequences of political polarization. Some scholars have suggested that forcing the generally moderate American people to choose between two clearly divided political parties will lead to increased involvement in politics and government. Others charge that polarization has positive outcomes, including more meaningful choices for the electorates between the parties, uh, more attentive to their bases, higher voter turnout in elections, greater engagement in campaign activism. Empirical evidence to date is, has been mixed, but as Congress grows increasingly divided, monitoring the electorate for changes in the partisan identification, issue positions, and political activity becomes significant for the health of the American democracy. There's a condition occurs known as gridlock. Gridlock is when the one party controls Congress, another party calls controls the White House, and they can't get anything done. You know, they and it's not a very pleasant situation. Political parties have been around a long time, they'll probably be around in the future. Have a good evening.